Okay, so now the can you can you just ask a little bit less cold because I have the head. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, in this talk, I want to introduce uh, weak solutions, and I will explain why. Uh, so, with the aim of homogenizing the audience. Okay, so um, I will first give an introduction, explain what means well possedness uh, motivations, uh, and then talking more uh, uh, technically about the distribution, subtle spaces and then weak solution and uh, periodic boundary condu condition, which is very important, as Nanda Kumaran said, uh, about uh, for uh, inhomogenization. So, okay, just uh, roughly speaking, a partial differential equation is something like a function f, who depends on u and uh, several derivatives, equal to a given function uh, small f, and in a given, and we want that this equation is satisfied uh, in uh, every point x belonging to some set omega over n. Um, for n equal one, there is no difference between partial differential equation and the ordinary differential equation, except for ad additional condition that I will show. Uh, so the, this mapping is called a differential operator, and so uh, the solution is supposed to have uh, uh, the derivatives in order to write uh, the equation. Now, uh, okay, the linear PD are, uh, fun are uh, PDs where the function capital F is linear, uh, so we can write in a very simple way, that means the sum of some coefficients uh, a alpha multiplied by some derivative equal f. Okay, uh, we call, uh, if the f is equal to zero, any linear combination of solution is still a solution, and this is uh, well known in physics because you can superpose different uh, phenomena. Uh, and this is called the, the superposition principle. Uh, okay, here we will take the case m equal uh, 2, so uh, second order derivatives, and in particular we will mainly talk about elliptic equation. I will explain uh, in a while what is an elliptic equation. Uh, many phenomena uh, in the real life uh, are uh, modeled by second order elliptic equation, uh, which is nice for mathematician because then uh, it's simpler than any general order, but sometimes one needs also other kind of model. Okay, so uh, Classical example of second order partial differential equation are the Laplace equation, uh, delta u equals zero, uh, where delta is the Laplacian operator, which is simply the sum of all the second derivatives. Uh, the corresponding non-homogeneous equation, delta u equals some f, well f is given, is uh, uh, called the, the Poisson equation. Uh, this equation, as Nanda already explained before, models some several phenomena, for instance, uh, the stationary thermal diffusion in an homogeneous material. Uh, homogeneous because no coefficients appear in this uh, equation. And also, well, it can describe the displacement of a thin membrane or some electric problem. Uh, so if you make a thermal diffusion, U is the temperature. If you want to discuss electrostatic fields, uh, then uh, uh, U is the potential, electrical potential. Uh, then uh, the first model, uh, let us discuss the first model, so the st uh, steady heat conduction. Uh, why we arrive to this equation? If uh, gamma is the thermal conductivity of a body which occupy, occupies some area omega, uh, then, okay, uh, the thermal conductivity describes the ability of the body to diffuse heat. Everybody knows that the heat uh, uh, diffuses differently, I don't know, in wood, metal, and other material. 
And so uh, suppose that you eat this body, uh, giving some uh, eat by a source that we call F, and uh, denote by U the temperature. So the flux of temperature is uh, uh, given by the product of the gamma uh, by the gradient of uh, U, and its divergence is the flux density, which is known, the flux density is equal to the uh, divergence of uh, the flux. Then, uh, if you do all that, uh, since gamma is constant, uh, divergence of gamma delta u can be written like minus gamma divergence of gradient, and divergence of gradient is exactly the Laplacian, so we arrive exactly to the Poisson equation. Okay, for, for the chemistry guy, don't worry, if you need to know more about the derivatives, we can look that in the afternoon. Okay, uh, so uh, I hope that the other knows derivatives. Okay, so now, if the body is inhomogeneous and anisotropic, what means? Inhomogeneous means that the body is not done uh, by only one material, but in the body there are several materials mixed, like uh, it will arrive in homogenization, and so it will depend on the point which material we have. And also anisotropic, anisotropic means that the body can have different behavior in different direction. Uh, and then in this case, the conductivity is given, uh, is not anymore constant, but is a matrix field A, uh, A, J of X. And then instead to have minus divergence of gamma gradient of U, we have the equation minus divergence of A gradient U equal F. This is, uh, this is the simplest example of equation in the divergence form. And, uh, okay, you understand why it's called in the divergence form. And uh, this will be our uh, model in all what follows. And uh, I will use this model for uh, tartar methods, for preferential domain, uh, and uh, now for discussing a weak solution. Okay. So, uh, this, imp this equation is very important because, as uh, uh, Professor Nanda Kumaran said, uh, this is the model equation also in uh, homogenization. Uh, other examples are, suppose that now F, the source of heat you put in your body, is not uh, steady, but stationary, but it varies in, the ti in time. So if F depends on time, obviously the temperature changes in time, so you have, to, uh, you have an equation which depends on time. And so if we do not by t the time, we have an additional term in the equation. Okay, u depends on x and t. And so its derivatives minus the divergence a of x uh, gradient of u, where the divergence and the gradient are taken only with respect to x, not with respect to time, equal f. This is the classical it equation. And which is very amazing is that in the well-known Black-Scholes equation in finance, uh, which has nothing to do with this it model, actually can be, uh, by some change in our variable, uh, uh, can be given by a similar equation. So the interest of partial differential equation, in my opinion, is that very diff uh, a semi equation can model very different situations. So this is the interest of mathematics and also the interest to study a general property of a class of equation that then you can use in any situations. Okay, so uh, another case, very interesting, we will not discuss here, but is vibrations. You can have uh, vibration means uh, any kind of vibration, or you have vibration through your body, you can have uh, uh, waves in the water, waves, uh, uh, acoustic waves, uh, uh, and uh, in, uh, uh, in homogeneous and anisotropic body, 
vibration are described by a, a, a question which has the second with order derivative in time instead of the first order derivative in time, like in the heat uh, equations. Uh, okay, uh, here many persons will talk about control. Control problems are important uh, in the vibra in, uh, vibration problem uh, because, uh, for instance, you take it plane and you are not happy if, uh, you know, the noise is very bad or the vibration of the plane is very strong, so uh, one uh, won't avoid vibration in many situations, then uh, the control of vibration is an important branch. Okay. Uh, now, now, now in general, partial differential equation like ordinary differential equation, you know, have uh, an infinity of solution or no solution. And uh, so, the first uh, one problem is the uniqueness of solution and uh, how we can find uh, uniqueness. We can find uniqueness adding some condition as uh, for uh, uh, ordinary differential equation, you add the initial conditions which describe uh, the state of the system in the beginning of the story, then uh, with the time you have uh, some evolutions. Here, uh, here uh, we add the boundary condition. Boundary condition means that you have your body and you won't prescribe here on the border, on the boundary, some uh, conditions. Okay, the condition you prescribe are not uh, any condition. They came from the physical problems in general. So, for instance, uh, the more uh, non-classical condition are what we call the Dirichlet conditions. Uh, so we impose the, um, the value of the solution on the boundary. The second one are the Neumann boundary condition. We uh, prescribe the flux, which is the, uh, which is the scalar product of A gradient U, uh, scalar N, where N is, where N you take the tangent, you take the normal, and you take the unit vector here going outside from the domain. This is n. And then uh, we prescribe uh, the um, a gradient u dot n, where n denotes uh, so this uh, unit uh, vector. And the third, you can prescribe also Robin boundary condition where you have some sum of the function and the flux. And so this uh, combined expression is called the Robin boundary condition. Okay, so the, what are the physical meaning of these three cases? When you, uh, condition one, uh, I mean, Dirichlet means that you fix the temperature on the boundary and you keep that temperature uh, uh, fixed. Condition two means that you prescribe the flux who go out from the body. And the condition three uh, translate the fact so that you can have an exchange on the boundary between the flux and the temperature. Uh, okay, so boundary, even for, uh, uh, I want just to emphasize that even for the case uh, n equal one, suppose that you have an interval a, b, you have here an ordinary differential equation. If you have, uh, uh, for instance, a second order ordinary differential equation, you prescribe, for instance, ER in that point, U and U prime. Now, if you have the same equation, but you want to look at this equation as a partial differential equation or boundary value problem, then you don't prescribe two conditions in the same point, but you prescribe, for instance, ER U of A and ER U of B or, for instance, U prime of A and U prime or B or mixing. So this is the main uh, and important difference even for n equal one with the ordinary differential equation problem. Okay, so initial condition, 
Now, if, when you have the two kinds of equations, uh, parabolic and uh, hyperbolic, uh, since you have also derivative in time, you have also to prescribe initial condition. That means uh, uh, you prescribe the value of the solution in the initial time, eventually is derivative in time if you have a second order uh, equation like uh, vibrations. Okay, so, uh, okay, and this describes the initial state of the system. Okay, now, there is a, an important concept in PDEs, which is the well-posed problem. Okay, um, obviously, uh, initial and boundary conditions depend on the problem, but uh, now you cannot, uh, you have to be reasonable. I mean, you cannot put too many condition, otherwise uh, you will not find any function who satisfies your condition. You cannot put uh, too few condition, otherwise uh, you cannot uh, have a uniqueness or you have underdeterminate problem. Okay, uh, for instance, for instance, we cannot couple any equation with any boundary condition. A very simple example is this one. You consider uh, 1D problem, uh, u second derivative of u plus u equals 0, u of 0 equals a, u of 2p equals b in the interval 0 to p. Okay, this is a classical uh, equation of the, how do you say, the uh, pendulo, what is it? Pendulo. <laughs> Okay, and uh, or you need to look, uh, and it is known that the solution of this equation, without taking account in uh, 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 is uh, a combination of sinus x and cosinus x by two constants c1 and c2. Now, to have the boundary condition, you have to fix the the constant. And the, the choice of constant is determined by those conditions, A and B. Okay, now it's clear that since we are, the problem, that problem is just in the interval zero to P. And so sinus and cosinus are periodic. To P periodic, so obviously U has to take the same value in A and to P. So you cannot prescribe a value in zero which is different from the value in 2p, otherwise you have no solution. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry, this is, uh, say, it's not a u of a, this is, thank you, this is a u of zero. It's just misprint. So if u of zero and u of uh, 2p are different, uh, no solution. That uh, means that you have to make care about what you prescribe. And uh, also a simple example of uh, non-uniqueness, uh, we will come back on that, so it's interesting to, uh, to discuss it. Always in 1D, for instance, you take the second derivative equal f in an interval a, b, and you prescribe, for instance, a zero derivative uh, on both sides. Okay, now if u is a solution, u plus c is still a solution. Since u prime is equal to u, uh, the derivative of u plus c is uh, u prime, and the deriv second derivative of u plus c is still u sec uh, second derivative of u. So, uh, so actually, if u is a solution, then u plus c for any real c is a solution. That means that this problem has an infinity of solution. And this problem is not so simple to study. One has to see what to put as condition in order to have uniqueness if one is interested to uniqueness. OK, now in general, if you take a linear mathematical model, uh, you like to have uh, existence and uniqueness of uh, your solution because uh, the problem you model probably has a yeah, unique solution. Uh, if you model temperature, you put, uh, you eat, uh, I don't know, you put some uh, heat, 
you have a temperature that is the temperature is unique and you have a temperature that exists a temperature. If you don't find solution, your problem is bad. So uh, this is one point. Second point is this is not enough. Because when you, suppose you put uh, some uh, heat, even in your kitchen, you just uh, change a little bit. Okay, not, nothing spectacular happens. I mean, just, uh, you know, the temperature is a little bit different. And then uh, that, me also, uh, that means that the solution has to vary not so much if the date varies not so much. Mathematically, this is a form of continuity. We can uh, describe it. And this is called the stability the solution with respect to the data. This is important also because sometimes the data are not exactly uh, measured because they are experimental or whatever. So, uh, okay, the problem is not all the, the problems are stable. And uh, there is a classical example, uh, I will skip here, but there is a classical example of a French mathematician, Adamar. Uh, he showed that you have a sequence of problems where the data goes to zero and the solution goes to infinity. So this is very strange because the solution should go to zero because if you put every, all the data equal to zero, you expect the solution is zero if the problem is linear. So, uh, so this, uh, uh, you know, led Adamar to introduce the following idea, uh, the idea of a well-posed problem. So just in general, in abstract uh, way, uh, you have two spaces of function, you have a partial differential equation in these spaces, uh, you give some bound of your initial condition, you have uh, a vector who represents all the data of the problem, let us call it F. Then the problem is well posed if you have existence, so that means for every set of data you have a solution. You have uniqueness, that means that your solution is unique. And then in some way the map, the map which associates to the data, the solution is continuous with the sum of a suitable uh, metric in those spaces. Okay, so this is what we look for. Uh, then, uh, in, uh, then, uh, okay, this is what we look for. Now there is another question, very important, is the how to solve a partial differential equation. Okay, this is uh, very difficult that in general we do not solve exactly uh, solutions, uh, partial differential equation, except some special case. For instance, you take a ball, you take uh, the function which are uh, with the radial symmetry, so they are like one dimensional problem, and then you are able to do something. Or if you can uh, develop your solution as product of the different variable and use some uh, power series uh, argument, but okay, these are some uh, very special cases in general. We, if you have a general omega, general coefficients, you are not able to solve your equation. So at least, at least as a mathematician, you want to know that your problem is well posed. This is why we look for theorem uh, of existence, uniqueness, and stability. And uh, these uh, show that your model is reasonable. Uh, and also, uh, another important point, which is also important in homogenization, is that when you have no explicit solution, uh, only things you can do is to find a numerical solution, which is an approximation of your solution. For partial differential equation, we have several methods, standard method like uh, finite, uh, uh, like, uh, okay, there is, uh, how do you call it? Uh, Ah, finite difference, sorry, finite difference method, which is a method, uh, classical method using, you know, the, uh, the growing of the solution, the, the ratio quotient and things like that. Now, 
for uh, variational solution, there is a very ad well adapted method, which is called the finite element method. And uh, uh, anyhow, you can make uh, uh, an approximation of your problem and find uh, uh, approximate solution. Now, if you do that, uh, you have no way to show that your original problem has a solution. You just make an approximation, so it is very important that you have a good background and that your model makes sense. So you're, you have a well-posed model, then you find the numerical solutions. Sometimes you are not able to find, uh, to prove existence theorem, so you try to find the numerical solution to have an inspiration how to prove that the problem is well posed. Nowadays, the things are more, you know, exchanging. Now, uh, okay, so, so um, this is why we wanted to find solutions. A well posed problem and um, a classical classification which is analogous to the classification of the conics that maybe you have studied uh, in your bachelor, like uh, you know that the um, quadratic form of second order uh, can represent in the plane uh, an, an ellipse, a, para, a hyperbole or parabole. Uh, according on the determinant of the terms of second order. Here we have, uh, for linear uh, constant uh, coefficient equation, we have a general classification in three types, elliptic equation, uh, like uh, uh, whose model case is the Poisson equation, parabolic equation, where whose model case is the heat equation with one time derivative, and hyperbolic equation, where the model case is the wave equation, two times derivative. The name elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic are not obviously casual, uh, by, uh, but they, uh, they have this name because this depends on the determinant of the second order coefficient matrix in the same way as for conics. That means that if the determinant is uh, positive, the quadratic for, associated quadratic form is, for instance, positive, you have a blitic. If is um, Okay, uh, some zero, you have parabolic, hyperbolic is negative, and so on. Okay, so anyhow, a linear second order equation can be reduced in canonical form. This is why what is important is to know these three kind of uh, equations. Things are more complicated if the coefficient depend on the variables, x. Okay, anyhow, uh, now uh, we look for theorems, so. Uh, which says that the problem is well posed. These theorems are difficult. In general, are difficult, and what is difficult also is that there exist, does there exist a, an existing theorem in PDE, but every kind of PDE uh, has its own theorem, has its own proof, and if you change something in the equation, you have to, again, to do the proof. Maybe you get inspiration of other proof, but you have to check again any time, any things, which is uh, good for us because we have a job for that. <laughs> okay, now uh, that means uh, that you need also some background, and uh, mm, so the theorem depends on what kind of a question you have, what kind of boundary condition, what kind of domain, what kind of coefficients, and what kind of data in general. So, uh, for instance, if we have, uh, let us do uh, the simplest case, linear elliptic equation, bounded domain omega, Dirichlet condition. Okay, then we can prove that the problem is well posed, but we have to pay a big price. The big price is that we have to require that the coefficients and the datum have a very strong regularity, even a continuous function f is not sufficient. 
uh, we, are, we need a complicated uh, framework, which is the framework of the elder continuous function, if somebody knows these functions. Uh, the model of elder function is uh, x to the power alpha, where alpha is not integer. And the domain has a smooth boundary, but a really smooth, like bolts or whatever, something like that. And uh, you can find the counterexample to show that if you are in, not in this framework, you cannot find the solution. OK, so all that is not so encouraging because, for instance, uh, if you have uh, like in homogenization, uh, uh, you know, your uh, heterogeneous situation, probably your coefficient, uh, which measure uh, the conductivity of the material, are uh, one year and two year or whatever. And then uh, this is not a continuous function. You have a jump uh, around the change of material. So continuous f, for instance, or continuous coefficients, or even more, is not adapted. Then, uh, but on the other end, uh, on the other end, you have uh, models. So you want to know how, what to do. And uh, uh, the solution obtained in this context are called the classical solution. And the result cover uh, many problems. Uh, so we need to find something else. For instance, uh, number two time I have to finish. Ah, OK. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, half an hour. OK, that's fine. fine. OK, so for instance, if f is a step function, that means a, constant, a function to take different constant, or if omega is a polygon, square, for instance, or triangle, uh, or, uh, in, or a polyhedra in a R3, uh, the assumptions are not satisfied. So what we can do in these cases where uh, experience say we have a solution. And so let us talk uh, again, uh, come back to the, our model problem, minus the divergence of A gradient U equal F with the Dirichlet conditions. You can uh, write explicitly divergence A of X like that like the sum of uh, these things. And suppose, for instance, f in L2. OK, for people who don't know L2, L2 is a space of function such that f squared is uh, integrable. So the integral of f squared is finite over omega. OK, so. Uh, we suppose, uh, as uh, Professor Nanda Kumaran say, uh, that A belongs to the space we denote M alpha beta omega because it's very short notation. You took two number, positive number, alpha and beta, with alpha smaller than beta. And uh, we suppose that uh, A lambda lambda uh, e, uh, is bigger than uh, equals the alpha times the modulus of lambda square, and uh, from up that a lambda is smaller than beta modulus of lambda. OK, this is the usual scalar product in Rn. This is the product of the matrix fields with the vector lambda. Then uh, the condition, this condition uh, is the, called the uniformly, uh, uniform ellipticity of the matrix, and means that you can control your matrix fields from below by a constant which is positive. And this one say that your matrix field is bounded from above. Then, then we wanted to introduce weak solution. What are weak solution? We uh, want to do that. We take the, the derivative in a weak sense, which is called the uh, sense of distribution. We uh, will say that the solution are not anymore uh, continuous with the continuous derivative uh, and so on, but they belong to a suitable functional spaces, space, which is called the Sobolev space. We also want that the solution do not satisfy point-wise anymore the equation, but satisfy some integral con equation, which we will call variational formulation. Then 
Uh, okay, now distribution and sub OLF needs uh, some more sophisticated background and you can uh, teach, I teach for instance in my place just a full course about sub -less spaces so there are a lot of properties but here in this context I will just explain the minimal properties in order to go on. So, I want to explain why we introduce those uh, sub -OLF spaces like that uh, and what is the idea. So consider this uh, prob oh, sorry. Consider this problem uh, minus uh, u second plus c u equal f uh, and we did clear. Suppose that c is positive, uh, continuous and f is continuous and define v, the space of the c1 function such that v of 0 equal v of 1 equal 0. And we know that uh, uh, v is dense in L2. That means that function in L2 can be approximated by function in V, in some sense, in the norm of L2. Then, then we define the, the, we consider this differential operator, and we have this theorem, which is simple to show, I will show in a while, which say that actually, uh, our problem, uh, a solu uh, we, if we have a solution in C2 uh, uh, intersection with V, then we have a solution of our previous problem. If and only if U, uh, the function U is a solution of this problem. Integral, so here you know you have the product U prime V prime plus C U V. Uh, and we have this uh, integral equal to that integral, but for every v in v. Excuse me. Uh, so, um, obse okay, let's go. Let us show first that. This is easy because you suppose that you have a solution, you multiply the equation by a function v, which is here, you integrate on 0, 1. So everybody knows the integration by parts. If you have a minus u, u second derivative, this is the product of this term minus u prime v computed between z, uh, in zero and one. But uh, uh, since v is zero in zero and v is zero in one, these terms uh, is zero. And then uh, actually this one is equal to this one. And so you have the equation before. On the other hand, uh, suppose that u is a continuous function which satisfies uh, the variational formulation, the formulation of the continuous function which satisfies the variational formulation, the formulation above, then uh, coming back with the integration by parts, you get this uh, identity for every v in v. This is very important. We cannot have this for only one function because if uh, the integral of two functions are equal, this does mean, obviously, that the functions are equal. You take two functions that the integral is one, but the function has nothing to do. But what the smart idea here is that you want that this is zero, not for one v, but for every v in your space, uh, capital V. Then, uh, since v is dense in L2, you can say that you have this equality also for every v in L2, passing to the limit in the integral, and then uh, the, uh, the function minus u, u second plus u minus f is an element of L2, and it satisfies uh, uh, the scalar product of phi with v is zero for every v. And then uh, the vector phi is orthogonal to every uh, vector of the scalar uh, of the of the Hilbert space, and this is possible only if the vector is zero. This proves that this is zero, and since phi is continuous, this is zero almost every, uh, in a for every point, and then it satisfies the equation. And uh, since it's in V, it also satisfies the boundary condition, so this completes the proof. Okay. Now, uh, we take inspiration from uh, this example. The problem, uh, integral problem uh, is called the variational formulation. 
And uh, you uh, is a solution if uh, the equality is satisfied for every v, as I told before. So this v is called a test function because we test this uh, equation on, on any function. And uh, now there is uh, something interesting. Let us come back to the formulation here. Actually, here you don't see any more second derivative. You have the first derivative of u, the first derivative of v. In some sense, this makes sense if u prime and v prime are in L2 and u and v are in L2. So, uh, we want to give a sense to this remark and try to find a bigger space than C2, an Hilbert space, that means a space with a scalar product H, and we want to find a solution there and taking a test function in this space H also. Uh, okay, and then when, once you do that uh, and you find a solution uh, that you call a weak solution, you have to prove that when everything is, uh, is uh, uh, continuous, then uh, uh, regular, then you find the, the usual classical solution. Okay, so uh, the subintable space H are some uh, subtle spaces. And in order to define them, one needs to introduce a distribution. Okay, distribution uh, is something like that. You take an open set in Rn, you define D of O as the space of the function where uh, infinitely differentiable on O, and such that the support, that means the set where the function is not zero, is a compact set contained in O. <laughs> and then you can define a sequence in D of O, and we say that it converges in uh, D of O if the following uh, conditions are satisfied. All the function, the sequence and the limit function has the support in the same compact K. For any, and for any alpha, the alpha derivative converge to the alpha derivative in the compact. Okay, this space is not so nice by itself because you cannot define a, topo a, topology, a, a metric on this space. That means that we only define the convergence of sequences and you can find a complicated topology on it, but uh, uh, for people who know topology, you can find uh, a suitable topology uh, such that the convergence uh, of the sequences is that one. Actually, we are not interested at all in the topology of D of omega. What is important is to know that this omega has, uh, is a, a space of very regular function, and what we look is density of this space in our situation. Okay, so uh, now we define a distribution which, which is simply a linear application from D of omega to R, uh, which is continuous on sequence, sequences in the sense that if phi n converges to phi in uh, the sense of the omega, then t of phi n converges to t of phi in R. Okay, and we denote by d prime the set of distribution. Okay, all that for the moment looks very abstract, but in a while will be more uh, the, uh, applied. Uh, then, okay, as an exercise, uh, in, uh, you can uh, try to show that uh, delta of x0 uh, of phi equal the value of the function in uh, uh, the point x0 is a distribution. This is uh, the so-called, uh, sorry, this is the, so, uh, excuse me, the first one, this is so-called the Dirac delta, and uh, it models something which is, for instance, zero everywhere and in one point jump uh, to infinity. Uh, for instance, an electric impulsion just in the point, in a moment, and then never again. Okay. And um, yeah, this function actually it was invented by Dirac when he was uh, uh, starting on the beginning of the quantic mechani uh, mechanics. So 
actually physicists uh, invented it. Okay. Uh, now, what uh, is interesting for us is this function, uh, this distribution. You, t you, you start with the function which is L1 lock, that means L, L1 in any compact contained in omega or even in L1 uh, to cure. And you define this mapping, the TF, which to any C define the integral over O of F phi. This is well defined because uh, phi has uh, compact support, so the integral actually works on uh, a compact. And then you can check uh, as an exercise that TF is a distribution. And one can also easily see that this uh, application that to a, uh, which to F associate the TF is one to one. That means that means that L1 lock and all, and in particular LP can be regarded as a subspace of the distribution cell identifying F with the TF. This is usually done in mathematics, you know, when you have a similar one-to-one uh, -one application with uh, things with similar uh, comport behavior, you can identify the spaces, and then you have the following de definition. You say that a distribution in, is in L1 lock or in LP uh, if actually this distribution is equal to TF, where F is a L1 log function or LP function. Because by itself a distribution is not a L1 function, but you can say that is an L1 function if is actually the distribution associated to L1 function. And in this case you say that T is a regular distribution. Okay, not all the distribution are regular, otherwise it's not necessary to use distribution, you could just use a LP function. But for instance, the direct function I said before, delta x0, is not a regular distribution, you can check that. Okay, with maybe our help. Uh, then, the main interest of distribution is that they have derivatives. And the derivative of distribution are defined like that, in something which looks like uh, integration by parts, because you take the derivative and you pass the derivative on the other function. So, you have a, fun a distribution T, uh, by this uh, bracket, we define the value of t in the, the derivative of phi with respect to xe for a given regular phi. Then you define the distribution, uh, derivative distribution, like the distribution of which on phi has minus the value of t on the derivative of phi. Okay? And so you can show that. The derivative, if t is a distribution, the derivative of distribution is a distribution for free. That means that you can, def you can derive infinitely a distribution, you have always distribution, so the derivative of distribution there exists always. Uh, there exists always, for instance, the derivative of the Dirac is uh, the, f the distribution uh, to phi associate minus derivative of phi to the point xe. Okay, now what is important for Sobolev space is, is the following remark that if a function and its derivatives are in L1 lock, then you can write integral in both sides. That means that you can write that the integral of derivative of f with respect to xe but multiplied by phi is minus f multiplied by the derivative of phi. Obviously, this derivative on the left side is taking, is taking in the distribution sense. Now, if f is regular in C1, then you can uh, use the green formula, and if you denote f uh, subscript uh, xe, uh, 
uh, the deriv usual derivative, then uh, you comparing this uh, equality, you have that the two derivatives are the same. So if the interest is that if f is c1, the derivative in the distribution sense and the derivative, the usual derivative, are the same. But, but be careful, because if f admits derivative not in any point, but uh, almost everywhere, even if it has derivative everywhere except only one point, then the two concepts are different. And one can look uh, examples, but uh, now I have no time here. But in the afternoon session, uh, if some, you are curious about some fact, uh, you can uh, ask. OK, so now we can talk about Sobolev spaces. <coughs> we, define, we define the Sobolev space W1P like the set of the function, which are in LP, such that uh, all the derivatives are in LP where the derivatives are in the sense of distribution. And uh, uh, we uh, consider this associate the norm, which is the sum of the norm of u in LP plus the sum of uh, all the derivatives in LP. For uh, p equal 2, which is the case we are interested here, we denote w12 simply by h1. Then uh, an interesting proposition is that that norm, which uh, that we defined before, is defined like, uh, is equivalent to that norm, uh, where the gradient is the sum of the power of the gradient. That means that, for instance, for p equal 2, the norm of u in h1 is equivalent to the norm of square is the integral of omega of u square plus the sum over e, the integral of the u over the xe squared over omega. So instead of to have, then if you remove the squared, you have here one big square root only. Instead of the square root of each term, like in the previous case, this is very nice because when you want to prove estimates, then you just keep the square of the norm, you prove the estimates, you have no, no roots anymore, only square, and then, you, then at the end you take the square root. Okay. So, what are the main properties of this space? First one is that, for instance, the, the space W1P is a Banach space. That means it's a complete metric space. That means that Cauchy sequences are convergent. And uh, uh, H1 is also for P equal 2, we have an invert space with respect to this scalar product. The fact that H1 is an Hilbert space is very important in the following. And uh, also you have some pro metric property like separability for P between uh, 1 and plus infinity, reflexive for P between 1 and plus infinity, those properties are important for weak convergences. And then uh, uh, you have an important theorem which say that D of Rn is dense in W1P of Rn. That's uh, very important because many properties uh, can be proved for uh, function in D, then you have all the usual, you know, calculus, and then by density, that means uh, by approximation, you can prove the results for the function in H1 or in W1P. This is what is done in all the Sobolev spaces theory. And also, another property is that if omega is uh, as a Lipschitz continuous boundary, then the set D of omega bar of the restriction to omega bar of function in D is dense in also W1P. So you, you mean you have a function in W1P approximate by the restriction of function defined everywhere. Lipschitz continuous boundary uh, is uh, means that you admit angle or uh, the uh, in your domain, not cusp. For instance, you, you not admit things like that. 
this is not a good domain, but you can have any kind of polygon or mixing a situation like that uh, and so on. This is important because in the application, in numerical application, you treat with the triangle, square polygons, so it's important to have that. It's more or less the minimal assumption on the domain in many cases, like for this uh, theorem. Uh, now, there is another space, which is a subspace of the previous one, which is the space H10, which is well, well adapted for Dirichlet boundary conditions. So the definition is that the subspace space W1P0 is the closure of D with respect to the norm of W1P0. In particular, H10 is W120. And this space has very important property. The first one is that if a function is defined on O, then is zero extension uh, denoted by U tilde still belong to the space. Uh, indeed, we have that if U is here, so is zero extension, belongs to W1P0 in any bigger uh, set, and the norm are the same. And the second important, uh, this is not obvious. It's uh, one can think that it is very simple. It's not so difficult, but it's not so easy because one has to prove that the derivative in the sense of distribution of the zero extension is nothing else than the zero extension of the derivative in the distribution sense. OK, then the rest is obvious. OK. One essential tool in H10 is what the so-called Poincaré inequality, which states that actually you can evaluate the norm of the function by a constant C, which only depends on omega, uh, multiplied by the norm of the gradient in L2. And uh, C omega is of, order, uh, is of the order of the diameter, uh, diameter of omega. As a consequence, on H10, you can take as a norm, not a complete norm, which is there, U plus the derivative, but simply the, norm, the sum of the norm of the derivatives. And this plays an important role when we will study the existence of our model case. Now, uh, I will discuss briefly our weak solution for the boundary conditions. Uh, so, let us come back to our model problem. We look uh, uh, a solution to satisfy a weak question of the equation, which we call variational formulation. How we find this variational formulation? But like in, in the example for the motivation, we multiply by a regular function. We do some uh, integration by parts or green, whatever. And we arrive to something which makes sense. And uh, we call it uh, variational formulation then we have to prove that it's a good uh, choice. And we want that this variational formulation is satisfied for any function phi, regular and by density for any test function in H10. OK, so in our model problem, the variational formulation is 1. Find u in H10 of omega such that this integral is equal to the integral of f v for any test in H10. Okay, the, uh, so the, as you can, uh, can see, the, actually the, the boundary condition is uh, contained in the fact that uh, the solution and the test are not in H1, but in H10. And uh, when u is continuous, the fact that the function is in 10 means uh, simply that <coughs> We have the Dirichlet boundary condition. OK, so uh, uh, one can prove that, like in the motivations, that uh, this problem is equivalent to the classical problem when uh, everything is regular. And uh, the main point is that uh, uh, there exists an abstract result, uh, so-called the Axe Milligram theorem, and uh, using uh, which states that if you have a continuous bilinear form on an Hilbert space, you have a function in the dual, if you have uh, the ellipticity 
uh, then uh, this variational uh, formulation has a unique solution and you have uh, suitable a priori estimates. A priori estimates means that you can estimate the, the function without knowing the function. And so this theorem applies to our model case and we have the following theorem. Uh, consider the model above, A in M alpha beta of omega, F in H minus 1, that means in the dual of H10, you can take in particular L2 functions, then you can find, uh, let us take in particular in L2, then you can write the integral, and you have that there exists a unique solution which verifies the variational formulation, and the a priori estimates is this one, that means that the function, uh, the number of the function is estimated by the Poincaré constant over the ellipticity constant multiplied by the norm of F in L2. Well, uh, okay. And then uh, this means that the problem is well posed in the Adamar sense. Okay, now, uh, Okay, now I think my time is over. Uh, I will speak in the beginning of the next lecture tomorrow about uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions. So even if my colleague will use, don't worry, I will explain why we, the solution exists tomorrow. And for the moment, I just stop here. Okay. <clears throat>